this man heard the audible voice of God that changed his destiny forever. Next on this edition of It's Supernatural. Centuries have come and gone, offering wisdom and understanding throughout the ages. Today, there should be nothing beyond one's power to discover. And yet, the strange, unusual, and mysterious world of the supernatural defies understanding. Stay tuned for a unique and powerful investigation into a curious, undiscovered universe only on It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. My guest says he was taking a shower, heard the audible voice of God, which has so dramatically changed his destiny. Randy, tell me what your life was like before that. Well, before, uh, before I heard the voice of God and before I even knew God, I was, uh, I was just, uh, by, by worldly standards, I was doing very nicely. Uh, all my friends thought I was successful in my business. My, I had a wife, two kids, a nice house, uh, comfortable life, everything was good. But let's take the facade off what was really going on inside. Really, I had a hole inside me that I couldn't satisfy. I thought it was a middle-aged crazy thing. Uh, I'd had an affair on my wife several months before uh, any, anything ever happened in my life. And, and I'd come to a point where I really felt like this is it, this business, my life, my wife, my kids, it's not worth it. Did you try I smoked, drugs? I, I did drugs, I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day, I, uh, I used pot daily, uh, uh, those kind of things, alcohol, I stayed up and watched TV all night long, uh, I watched football from Thursday through Tuesday, so uh, all in all my life was pretty much a mess, it was just get by one day to the other. With did no, you think it was a mess though? Or did, did, you, did you have an inkling or were you just fooling yourself too, like the world? No, deep down inside I knew it was a mess and I knew I couldn't go on with it, I wasn't happy. And I'd come to a point where I decided I'm giving up. I was going to leave. I was just going to pack up my car and drive off but, into the but, sunset. But you have children. You, how could you do that? I don't know. I just, I just didn't really care about it all that much anymore. i just gotten to the point where that didn't matter. Well, what changed that? Well, at that point, my daughter came home from, uh, she was going to this church meeting on Wednesday nights with some other, a lady came over and picked her up and took her. She came over and said, Dad, I want to get baptized. And I was like, oh, go ahead, that's fine. I didn't really care. And she said, no, no, you have to go up and meet the preacher before I can get baptized. And I said, no, I, I really don't want to do that. So uh, she finally talked me into doing that. And then I went up and met the preacher, but he wasn't there. So I was standing around the church going, well, this guy's not going to show up. Well, you know, I don't know how that works exactly. But So then I thought, well, we'll just kind of stay here. A prayer meeting started, and I heard somebody in there mention, has anybody heard about this church in Pensacola, Florida, where there's a revival going on? People are getting saved, lives are being changed, hookers, prostitutes, all that kind of thing. And I just kind of laughed and thought, revival. <laughs> I, I, I could care less about that. Uh, all I wanted to do was get out of there. So later that, you know, the pastor never did show up, so we ended up leaving. I went home that night. I sat down and started uh, looking through the internet about 9.30 at night. Uh, smoked a couple of joints and was relaxed. And let's look around at some stuff. And I thought, oh, hey, if there's a bunch of stuff going on, let's see if it's so big, there'll be something on the internet about this Pensacola thing. So just out of curiosity, I looked it up. Well, the next thing I knew, I looked up and it was 8.30 in the morning and I printed off about 200 pages. Uh, on my worn out my cartridge. Did you my, read it all? Yes, sir. Why? Uh, I don't know. That's I just, crazy. I just started reading it, and that's and, not as and, exciting as football. What were you doing that for? I don't know. Just there was something about lives being changed and people being healed and all these kind of things, and I'd never seen anything or touched anything like that. And it was just to me, it was more interesting than anything else. D did your wife and family know you had spent all night on the internet? Well, my wife did when she woke up in the morning and thought I was crazy. Uh, so, and so did I. So quite honestly, uh, it, was, it was not a, I don't know, it was just kind of, I, I couldn't believe I did it. I had to go to work that day. I lived in San Antonio, Texas. I had to drive about an hour north to Austin, Texas. So I went and got my car and was driving and I saw this little Baptist church as I drove by it up on the hill. 
I remember looking at it and saying, God, I don't care what you're doing in Pensacola, Florida. I'm not even going to drive five miles to this little Baptist church to come see you. I'm sure not going to go to Pensacola, Florida. That was pretty nervy. Well, I, I was at that point in my life where I, I really didn't care. Okay. And I just told God, I'm not interested in what you're doing. I could care less. And about that time, right up out of the dashboard of my van came a sign that came right up in front of my eyes that said Pensacola. What, what kind of sign? Well, it was like a, about the size of a dollar bill, a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. and it came up and blocked my eyes and it said Pensacola across it. And I couldn't, I, I'm doing 80 did, miles did an hour down the highway. Your, obstruct your vision? Yes. And I couldn't see. Talk about getting your attention. Well, I was, <laughs> thought I was about to die <laughs> driving along a freeway in rush hour traffic. Yeah, so, you, mu uh, you must have just, uh, it, it just, just an imagination or you're tired. You hadn't slept that night, so. But that was my immediate thought. I said, okay, I'll go. And the sign went away. Why and did then, you say you'd go? I don't know. It you just, didn't want to go. I know, but it just came out. I was trying to get this sign out of my face. I said, uh -huh. I'll go. And the sign went away. And then I immediately thought, this is what happens when you stay up and read the internet all night. <laughs> and I just, computer burned onto my, onto my eyes, this Pensacola thing. So as that happened, I, I, I kind of, you know, made my heart race for a couple hours. And I, uh, a little later the next, or later that day, I thought to myself, I'm going to test this thing one more time. And I said, God, I don't care what you're doing in Pensacola. I'm not going there. And here the sign came again and blocked my vision a second time. And immediately I knew what to do to make it go away. I said, okay, I'll go. And the sign went away. Were you telling the truth? Yes. Sir. I, I, I went home. I looked at my wife and I said, I need to get a plane ticket to Pensacola, Florida. And what did she think? <laughs> she was just, what for? And I said, I don't know. I saw this sign and she thought I'd seen an advertisement on the highway billboard right. that said, you know, a cheap rate to Pensacola or something. She didn't know what it was because I've always been kind of an impulsive guy. And uh, she said, well, what are you talking about? And when I told her more about this, uh, she basically thought I was crazy. And, the main, and she looked at me and said, you can't go 700 miles to Pensacola, Florida without getting high. You've never done that in your life. And I said, well, I'm going to give it a try. So I got my car and a couple other guys that I knew kind of piled in with me as a let's go see what this is all about thing. And we drove to uh, Pensacola. And uh, I'd never, understand, I hadn't been in a church in off and on a couple of churches here and there, but I'd never been in a... That wasn't your thing. No, no, I, I, I'm not a big church goer. So it was in December, we showed up out in front of the church two o'clock in the afternoon for a service that started seven at night and there were 500 to 1,000 people standing in line out in there. In line at a church? Standing in front of the church why in line. Why were they all, why, why did they want to go in there? I don't know. Same reason, I guess they saw signs too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know anything about it. All I know is I was very uncomfortable. And uh, I stood there for, what, five hours and then uh, got into the church and had a seat right up on the second row. How'd that happen? Well, I don't know. I was at the back of the line, but somehow there just happened to be three seats for us all right there on the second row, uh, right in the front of the church. So, What'd uh, you think of what you saw? Well, at first I walked in and I saw people, you know, shaking their heads and doing it. And I, I thought, well, maybe they're here to be healed. I, I don't know, you know. what. I'll wrong. tell you, he saw some pretty strange things and we're going to find out about it. But the strangest of all is when fire hit him. Yes, you heard me right. Fire hit him. We'll be right back after this. We'll return with Sid Roth and It's Supernatural right after this. Hello, YouTube Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word. It means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe. Then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. I'm speaking with Randy Kinzel. This man, his marriage was a mess. I mean, it looked okay on the outside, but he knew better. It was a mess. He's into drugs. 
uh, his business is going okay, and a sign, a supernatural, I mean like a billboard almost, but supernatural, blocks his view as he's driving his car. He can't even see until he agrees to go to a church in Pensacola, Florida, Brownsville Assembly of God. He goes, he's not a churchgoer, he has to wait in line five hours just to get a seat. Thousands of people like him are lined up to go into this church. Supernaturally, he's in the second row. Tell me, Randy, what you saw with your eyes that was different. Well, I saw all kinds of things that I'd never seen before, not being somebody who'd ever even really gone to church much. In the churches I'd gone to, I'd never seen anything like this. Uh, I didn't know what to expect or, and didn't go in with any expectations. Just knew that I was supposed to be there. And uh, it just the minute the praise and worship started, they started playing the music. People started jumping up and down and throwing their hands up in the air. And, I, and, I, and I'd never been exposed to anything like that, seen anything like that. So to me, it was, it was a little, it was different. Were you uncomfortable? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I would I, think so. I was so. a little bit uncomfortable. I was. So, so why'd you even stay? I don't know. Uh, I, I, I kept wanting to leave, but I never could. And then finally I got to the part where, you know, they, they took up an offering and then the, the pastor came up to, so a guy came up to preach and he got up there and started preaching and, and he was a down to earth guy. I really liked that. You know, I hadn't heard anybody ever before preach like this, but every now and then it was like, that hurts. There was something that, what hurts? It was, I, I don't know. It was like he was shooting me with a gun in the chest or something, but I kept feeling pain hit me hmm. and, and it was very, it was, it was strange, so then he said, okay, everybody move your chairs, and I, I was a little mad. I traveled 700 miles, and here I'm going to lose my chair in the front of the church. <laughs> so I, I didn't understand that, but I was like, okay. So I, I moved my chair, and I thought, well, this is the point where I slip out the back door. I've been pretty good at that all my life, and I didn't really know what an altar call was or you know, what, they mm -hmm. were, what they were about to do. And as I was headed towards the door, uh, the, past, the preacher said, sir, and I, for some reason, it felt like he was talking straight to me. So I stopped and I, and he told me the very things I was doing were going to send me to a place I didn't want to be. And if I wanted forgiveness, I had to come down and repent of my sins. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I remember standing there going, okay, it made sense. And the more he said it, then when he said run, if you're serious, you run, I ran. I had to apologize to the little old lady I almost knocked over. <laughs> she she was walking. That doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you run for an altar call? Well, I don't know. That's just what he told me to do. So I did. I was just trying okay. to do what God wanted me to do, I guess. I don't know what I was doing. I just ran. I went on my face and I cried. And God did something in me. Because when I stood up, I was totally different. I remember standing up and reaching down and pinching my skin and just, what's happened? I could not explain it at all. Someone prayed for you there. Well, and then this lady in the church came up and said, how are you doing? And I said, okay, well, you know, what is this all over me? And she said, well, look, there's Dr. Mike Brown. Let me go get him to pray for you. So she went and got him and he walked over to me, put his hand on my shoulder and said, what's your name? I said, Randy. So where are you from? San Antonio. What are you here for? Everything God has for me. And the minute I said that, I saw two fires light up in each one of the pupils of his eyes. And he put his hand on my stomach. And after that, I, I don't really know what happened. What, uh, what happened? What, what, what occurred to you? I mean, did you pass out? What, what happened? Well, I, I think I, I went down to the floor. I don't know how. How tall are you? 6'4". How much do you weigh? About 280. Did he push you down on the floor? No. 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 Uh, no. Uh -uh. What is this he fire just, business? I don't know. He put one hand on my stomach like this and said, fire. And it scared me, it startled me when I saw the, the fire in his eyes. I, I, real, I fire, what, real fire you saw in his eyes. Two flames lit up in each one of his eyes. Uh, listen, I've got to go to Dr. Michael Brown and see exactly what this fire is. Let's go to Dr. Michael Brown at Brownsville in Pensacola, Florida. I'm interested in that fire that was in Michael Brown's eyes. The best way to find out is to go directly to Dr. Michael Brown. Michael. What is this fire that Randy saw in your eyes? Well, obviously, I didn't see it. I wasn't aware of it. But it's, it's the fire of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that God himself is a consuming fire. And Jesus said he comes to 
baptize us, to immerse us in the Holy Spirit and fire, and that we should be on fire for God. When I pray for people, I often cry out, fire! God, burn out the sin. God, fire! Set them ablaze. Fire! And we've been amazed to see all of us praying for people. It's not me, but all of us praying for people in this revival, seeing people bound by homosexuality, and they get up, and their desires left them. A, a lady came up to me, she said, I'm 22. A year ago, I came to one of your meetings. She said, I've been a drug addict for two years, drinking for two years, sexually immoral. The relationship with my parents was broken down. I was smoking cigarettes. She said, I came to the meeting, you prayed for me. She said, I said the word change, change, change over her. She fell to the ground under God's power. She said, I got up, I have since, in this last year, had no desire for a cigarette, for a drink, for a drug, to sleep around. My parents and I are reconciled, and the parents came over to me with tears and said, we have a new daughter. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray for everyone that wants to receive this fire right now? I'd love to. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that fire would fall on everyone viewing, that the fire of your spirit would burn in their hearts, that you would remove everything that stands between them and God, that you'd burn up the uncleanness, that you'd burn up the complacency, that you'd burn up the, the traditionalism, that you'd burn up the fear of man, and that you would bring them into a face-to-face -face encounter with you. And everyone watching who knows you, set them ablaze for you. Let Holy Spirit fire fall. The same fire that fell when Elijah prayed and consumed the sacrifices. Let fire fall in every home of every viewer now in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. And I am fascinated by this fire. I don't know about you, but I'm fascinated. Randy, it's nice you had this fire business, but what did you tell your wife when you came home? Well, it wasn't necessarily what I told my wife, uh, as it was what she saw in me. She looked at me and said, you're different. What happened? And I just told her, I said, well, I, I went down there and met God. And she said, and what does that mean? And I said, well, all things are different now. I, I don't smoke anymore. I don't do drugs anymore. I don't cuss anymore. Uh, I don't watch TV anymore. I mean, it just all the desires for all these things just went away. Football. You played, you played football in college. That, is, that was important to you. Yes, sir. I played at the University of Texas college football, and I've been a football fan all my life, but I just I, I didn't have time for it. I didn't even watch the Super Bowl that year, any of the playoffs or anything. So, uh, But you were taking a shower, minding your own business, and what happened? Well, God had, God had been dealing with me about, about going to the school of ministry, and I'd been kind of fighting with that a little bit because I own my own business. I'm 39 years old. I have a wife and two kids. I was taking a shower and, and, I, and I told God, I said, if you'll confirm it with me 43 times that I'm supposed to go. Well, where'd you get the 43 from? I don't know. Just a number <laughs> that popped out of my head. So, and, and as time had gone on, it just... You really didn't want to go. <laughs> no. No, no, no. I mean, I, I did, but I didn't. I just wanted to do whatever God wanted me to do, but I really felt that to walk away from everything I have and go, I, I didn't understand that. So I told God, you gotta make it real clear. I don't wanna make any mistakes. I, I, I can't afford to at 39 years of age. So uh, I, was, I was taking a shower and I heard God spoke to me in an audible voice or somebody spoke to me and said, I sent you something in the mail today and you didn't even check your mailbox. And when I heard that, I fell down. I, it just Why did you fall down? Just a fear came over me I, I didn't know what it was. My knees started shaking. I was looking around. I thought, is there somebody in my house? You know, I'm, I'm in my shower. So uh, anyway, well, when I got up, I obviously dried off and ran outside and checked my mailbox. My wife was just, what are you doing? I said, I got to check the mailbox. And there was an application to the Brownsville School of Ministry in there. So I had a pretty good idea that's what I was supposed to do. A voice tells you to look in your mailbox. Right. You look in your mailbox, there's an invitation to go to Bible school. Uh, what about those 43 confirmations? Well, that made like number 37 or 38. Really? Right there. So uh, the next morning, a telephone call, a pastor in town called me up and said, I was praying last night and God told me he was going to send you something in the mail that would confirm your future. And uh, well, I was like, okay. So 
And, and we had planned to go down to Brownsville uh, over the week of Thanksgiving. So at that point, we, uh, after that we left, I had my 39 confirmations, went down there, sat down in the first service and Dr. Brown saw me and looked at me and kind of come over here. I walked up to him, he said, uh, I haven't seen you, how have you been? I said, great. He said, aren't you supposed to be going to the School of Ministry? What number was that? I said, well, that's number 40. And he looked at me puzzled and said, what? And I said, well, I told God 43 confirmations and I'd, I'd be there. So uh, he said, well, I'm believing if he gave you 40, he can give you the other three. So uh, he invited me to a teaching on Friday. I went to that. During the teaching afterwards, he has a little time of just, we'll just wait on the Lord. And I remember praying. I put my head down. I said, Lord, if you're really calling me out, do it right now. Do it supernaturally so that I know that it's you. And I want to know that I know. And I need you to do it three times. So you're God. Do whatever you're going to do. And after that, uh, somebody started speaking in a different language I didn't understand. And then an interpretation came out that said, I'm calling you out, I'm calling you out, I'm calling you out to the service of the Lord. Immediately after that, my wife looked at me and said, that was for you. And I said, I know, time to go. <laughs> and I knew. What did you do with your business? You had a, a good business. Well, my wife and I gave it to a lady that was gave in the church. It? Yes, sir. How, how, how valuable was this business? Well, that, you know, you can debate that all day long. Uh, it produced a six-figure income for me for over eight years. You gave, but wait, you're gonna, going to be a student. You're going to need money. Why would you give it away? Well, I really felt like God had dealt with me that if I was to do this, I'd seen how far I could go on what I had. Now it was time to let him show me how far he could take me. All right, tell me the change in your life right now. Your, your, your marriage, it was stinking before. How is it now? put together in a way that it's never been. I love my wife like I've never loved her before. What about, never. what about money? Let's get practical. Well, God's been, God's been providing everything I need. Uh, I moved down here in faith with just a few thousand dollars. I've paid all my tuition. Uh, I've paid my bills. I've taken care of it, so. Drugs, you need that. I mean, come on now, you need that every once in a while? No, sir. I've not smoked a cigarette. Uh, Right after that, I tried to smoke a cigarette and had to throw it away. I thought it tasted bad. I fired up another one. It tasted bad. So I just thought, well, I'll pray. I said, God, do you want do you, me to do, you do miss, this? Do you miss it? Not at all. Did you hear what he said? Not at all. Not at all. Why? Because he, it, it was a forceful thing? No. God gave him something better. Now, when he heard a song at Brownsville Assembly God in Pensacola, Florida, a, a, a young lady, Charity James sings the mercy seat. When he heard that, he had a compulsion to get right with God. I believe that when you hear this music of Charity Jane, James, that you are going to feel the Ruach, the Spirit of the living God, come upon you. And when you reach out to God and say, God, I'm a sinner, forgive me. I make Jesus my Messiah and Lord, watch what happens. Joy, peace, purpose, destiny. I can't wait. Come on. Of a lifetime of sin, lovely illusions, they never come true. I know where there's a place of mercy for you. to his presence without fear into the holy place where his mercy hovers near come running come running come running to the mercy seat where Jesus come is on. calling his grace will be a covering his beloved I need the Lord. The I need the Lord. it will provide I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Come on, pray. 